Um, <clears throat> excellent. So, so we, we heard that OpenID and OAuth, OAuth are, are somewhat related. Um, Eric, if you could help us understand how, how this works, how they are interrelated, how they work together. Sure. So I'll, I'll give an example we've been working on the last few months. So I'm sure almost everyone here has signed up for some social network of, of Plex, so uh, MySpace, LinkedIn, Facebook, et cetera. And traditionally, the number of steps required to do that is quite lengthy. You know, go to a site, tell them your email address, your password, verify your email address, enter in the email and password of your mail account, pull in that information. And th there are a lot of steps in there. And generally speaking, at best, maybe two thirds of the user will get through that process. So one of the things that we've been doing between the OpenID and OAuth groups is uh, we've been pursuing something that Plaxo likes to call the open stack, a concept um, that where Plaxo, to be honest, has really been uh, pushing all of us with very specific use case. Um, their goal is, you know, hey, if you as a user receive an invitation from one of your friends to join yet another social network, you could click on that invitation in your email, be sent to that social network provider's website, they know what, you know, whether you are a Gmail user, Yahoo user, Microsoft user, they can uh, then at that point um, bounce you back to your email provider site and ask, uh, you know, for your identity through protocol like OpenID. They can ask for access to your address book, which is using OAuth for the security part, and then the address book itself can use a format like portable contacts designed for better data portability. And um, we're combining what used to be four, maybe even five steps into a single step. And we spent a lot of time the last few months uh, optimizing this. And at least in Plaxo's case, we've taken their success rate from about 60%. Now it's pretty consistently around 92%, which is relatively unheard of in those types of registration environments. And almost all the work that has been done the last six months, a key point, has been on user interface, not on the technology. Uh, to be honest, we could do the technology a lot of different ways. But we do a lot of just percentage experiments with user interface to figure out uh, how to tweak things. And it, it's been a humbling experience. Uh, as one example, when we started out testing this, we would actually let users know, hey, it's this great new sign-up process. You won't have to create your own password. And we found that adding that sentence actually reduced sign-up rate for some reason, to basically you know, trying to uh, call out the sexiness of the technology we're doing. And we actually had to sort of get rid of those things and just get the users through to the end point. And we never told them they were doing federated login. We never pointed out they didn't need a password. In fact, doing so complicated things for them. They understood what we were doing anyways. And so you know, it's that type of user interface work that we're very focused on now. Mm -hmm. Great. So <clears throat> you talked about, Eric, some, some linking some of the logins, uh, linking some of the registration information, right? right. Uh, Trent, could you help us understand how this would play with users' data privacy, uh, data security issues, not just in the consumer space, but also in the in the enterprise B2E and B2B environments. Yeah, actually, that's that. Eh, you know, what was just outlined is is the you know the common use case. You're you're a user and you want to uh, link all of your systems together. Maybe not all of the data from all the systems. Maybe some data from over here. Your your social graph from this site over here, and you need to you know be able to identify specifically which pieces of the puzzle you want to have access and visibility at any given time, OAuth being a very interesting uh, piece to that. In the data portability project specifically, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out the patterns, trying to figure out what it is that the, from an end user's standpoint, what do they want from an engagement with a social networking platform. So as an example, uh, when the user uh, thinks they know what they're going to get from uh, something like Facebook. They know that when they uh, enter the system, they give it information, and then they start friending people. It, they kind of understand what that means within the context of, of Facebook. But as we went forward from the Data Portability Project and started patterning that information and saying, OK, from a, from a social standpoint, what happens when you then move some of your data or you want to merge some of your data with that from Plaxo or something like that? The, 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 all sorts of very interesting non-technical questions started to bubble up. Now, we, the Data Portability Project, initially thought it might be predominantly a technical problem. So as we went to enterprises and said to the enterprise, well, you know, we can help you with hooks to pull the data from social networking site A into, you know, banking site B. Well, at the end of the day, it did turned out not to be a technical problem. But as we were looking at the patterning, it turned out to be a social problem or a social conundrum that needed to be solved. Does the user always want all of their information to be shared? So it's not just a, yes, please link 
Plaxo and Facebook. It is, you know, link some of my data from Plaxo and some of my data from Facebook and some from LinkedIn and, and keep it entirely out of, um, you know, triplex.com or whatever. And as we started to look at these things, we realized that it is not a one size fits all. And we've started moving a lot more into uh, the area of exploration as it relates to policy and uh, uh, end user license agreements in terms of service. Because it's the policy layer that we see that is, is a very interesting space that that's, needs a lot more work to relate the social networking parties to the business and enterprise parties because there's a contract with the consumer, whether it's perceived or real, whether it's legal or just you know, in the user's head, that needs to be addressed and solved. OAuth and OpenID and these things, uh, the, you know, the technologies, uh, SAML and, and um, you know, other federated uh, you know, s uh, technologies are there to support this, but without an exploration of the end user's viewpoint of this, um, it's going to be very difficult to tie an enterprise together with a social network or social networks to social networks. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, what, I, what I'd like to ask all of you, and maybe just we're going to go around, and some of the concerns that I've been hearing from a lot of IT clients and, and end users around any kind of a, a federated protocol is that it is, it, is, it is extremely difficult for a normal person to understand what uh, OpenID, what uh, InfoCard, what Higgins, what Bandit is, right? Uh, how do you and your organization help uh, the the lay people, like the lay person out there, to understand what what um, your technology is all about, and and lead to the, the adoption of the technology. So maybe we'll start with you, Dale. It, it's, yeah, I think it's a good question. It fits uh, in a lot of the discussion we've had here. Uh, uh, just as I'm sitting here listening to my panel members, that every point is good, but it sounds like it's a huge area. Uh, from the protocol families to how it's usable to uh, how to how to help end users actually understand what this stuff means and why. And the the thing that I keep coming back to is that um, I think most of us here believe that this is building a new layer uh, of of capabilities on top of the internet. And the the best way I can think of explaining it to our end users is it's like finances that we need to separate the source of the financial uh, data or, or the finances themselves into like banks, that's like identity providers, and separate that from the uh, places where the identity information is consumed, which most of these protocols refer to as a, as a relying party. And then on top of that, there's social concerns, there's usability concerns, there's user interface concerns. All of that is, is valid, but if you follow the analogy back to our financial system that has evolved over hundreds of years in, in the world, um, uh, that we, we had to have that uh, length of evolution, we had to have that separation of banks from businesses so that we could enable a whole new level of productivity, commerce, et cetera. Right now, every site I go to on the internet, it's like it's its own separate identity vault. I have to have my own account, my own password. We're trying to get the data portability uh, aspect of it from one to the other and control that, those transactions. Um, yes, it's a big area, and we need to work on everything from the, uh, uh, the user interface to how to explain it to users, but I, I personally believe if we keep the pressure on all of these areas, we will end up with something of value similar to the financial system that we live with today that many people deal with much more complexity on an intuitive level uh, right now with their finances, their credit cards, their checks, their cash. They know the different use cases of each of those. They don't want any of them to go away. Uh, I think similar in our identity protocols, there's different use cases for each, and we will get to a point where people intuitively understand these things. Mm -hmm. 